Hi, everyone. Good evening. We are so glad to have you here. This is the Managing Your Medical Team webinar, and we have a great lineup for you tonight. So we have a brief disclaimer. I'm sorry. We have a brief disclaimer, just the, the information opinions expressed in this presentation are not intended as medical advice or recommendations. Um, you should always consult your doctor about a specific health program or anything like that. And then, of course, we would love to thank our sponsors, Myovant Sciences, Pfizer, Foundation Medicine, Metal Health, UCSF, the Boster Center for Multiple Sclerosis, and Bagot. We are so glad that you are here joining us tonight, and we want this webinar to be super interactive. So we actually have a questions panel, which you should see at your right. And anytime you think of something, go ahead and ask a question, and we're going to have a great Q&A scheduled. And we look forward to hearing from you, and we can't wait. So I'm going to introduce Rick, the founder of ANCAN, to get us going tonight. He's muted. You're muted, Rick. <laughs> ah, you got me. Sorry about that, folks. Um, Rick Davis, I am the founder of ANCAN. This is true, and um, it's really an honor for me to be here today amongst the panelists that, that we have for you. Um, most of you are familiar with ANCAN. Um, if you're not, uh, we innovated virtual group meetings a long time ago, back in 2010. Uh, in 2015, we introduced the, uh, the video chat element uh, that most of you are very familiar with today. Um, in 2016, we created ANCAN, Answer Cancer Foundation, um, doing business as ANCAN. And uh, we've continued to grow since then, um, uh, included uh, more than just cancer. And many of you I know are from the MS community tonight. Uh, that's one of the additional groups that, that we have. Um, it, it's, it's a true, true pleasure for me to be able to introduce uh, the, uh, your moderator and your speaker tonight because it is a, a man who I have incredible respect for on so many levels. Um, I first met Dr. B.J. Miller um, when I was a patient at uh, UCSF. Uh, fortunately, I didn't need his services because I'd already started uh, doing some navigation. And some of the men who I did navigate were patients of BJ's uh, in the symptom management service, which is a euphemism uh, for palliative care and a very sensible euphemism, I might add, too. Um, and so I came to know of BJ um, and I saw in practice the impact that BJ had on the lives of these men who had significantly advanced cancer and they would come into our support groups and not knowing which way to turn and my first question to them would be well when was the last time you spoke to bj oh yeah i need to give him a call and they did and um it, it was just it, it is remarkable how this man knows how to talk to people um, who have advanced disease and some of whom are nearing the end of life. It's, it's incredible, it's a gift, and, 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 and um, I'm in awe. Um, when we thought about this webinar, which was to see, to help you put together the best possible medical team that you can, I immediately thought of BJ, because BJ, in his function in SMS, was able to bring in other disciplines and to integrate disciplines. And it, it takes a lot of skill to be able to be there and to help your patient navigate their way through all these disciplines. And um, in his new position at Metal Health, Metal Health, which he's created, which he'll tell you about, um, I thought this would be a fantastic opportunity 
to, to for ANCAN to work together with mental health. Um, just as a um, as a point of interest, because I've got his bio here, um, BJ has a specialty in in um, in palliative care. Um, he he originally was undergraduate at Princeton. I think he was on the rowing team there too. I've heard tell. Um, so that made him a hero of mine. Anybody who can get a rowing scholarship to Princeton is, is amazing. Um, and then went from there to UCSF where he did his medical degree and um, he did his, um, his internship uh, in Santa Barbara, came back to UCSF and uh, spent a lot of time. I will point out that there is a small error in, in BJ's bio. He mentions that his um, TED talk, What Matters Most at the End of the Life, has 11 million views. When I last looked, it was about 13.7 million views. <laughs> so that needs updating a little bit. And if you <laughs> haven't seen the TED talk, please do so. And with that, it's, it's my true pleasure to introduce you, BJ. Mm, thank you, Rick. That is so nice to hear from you because um, because I know you mean what you say. So I'm tempted to actually hear you. <laughs> <laughs> to listen to you. <laughs> so it's very sweet. I'm, I'm really happy to be here with you, Rick. I've loved sharing patients over the years and our friendship over the years and being in Arizona that one time with you. And la, la. So I'm a big fan of yours too, pal, and what you're doing with Thank Andy. You. I'm really happy that Mental Health and 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 Anne can get together on this. So thank you for having me. My pleasure. And I'm cutting out. It's all, all right. Bye. All right. Bye. Okay, guys, so <clears throat> now that Rick's gone, uh, just kidding. Um, why don't we, so I'm gonna introduce, my job is really to moderate, um, and I'll talk too, we'll see. This is gonna meant to be a conversation and also hopefully plenty of time to get to the good, the fun Q&A um, dialogue work. So let me introduce the, the panelists. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very lucky because I get to, I already know a lot of folks in this group. So let's start with Karen Skanke, um, a dear, dear friend of mine whom I've known for years. As uh, Rick was mentioning about the symptom management service at UCSF. Hi, Karen. Um, you know, Karen and Mike Rabel really founded that symptom management service, it was really one of the first outpatient palliative care clinics in the country, um, which is, you know, that's let's go back to 2006, 2007, somewhere in there. And that's not that long ago. And it's one of the first in the country. So these guys, Karen's used to doing novel work. So 35 years or something like that, Karen, you've been as an LCSW doing clinical work, education work, research, you name it. I mean, everyone on the panel today, I'll just say right now, I mean, we are talking about working across disciplines with each other. But what's interesting, I mean, this group is everyone is themselves something of an interdisciplinary, walking interdisciplinary crew. I mean, everyone on this panel brings various pieces of themselves to the mix and has worn many hats. So there's a diversity within each of us and a diversity among us. So, um, so Karen, I mean, one thing, a great thing that Karen has done about her work is she's applied it in many different spheres uh, across species even. <laughs> so, um, Trauma work, sexual health work, disability issues, things that don't often find their way into a typical clinical encounter. Karen has been very facile with and it's been beautiful to work with you, Karen. Um, you. I'm humbled to be here with all of you and BJ Omay. This is great. Right on, girl. So, right. So let's go. So, so Lady Bird Morgan, another dear friend of mine, lucky, lucky me. Um, Lady Bird is another. She's a social worker and she's a nurse. And she applies herself in all sorts of beautiful directions. Um, you know, she's co-founder of the Humane Prison Project, uh, which is uh, a group at San Quentin that I've gotten to work with Lady Bird uh, a little bit on. I mean, for her, with her. Um, that's brief. She brings, so the Humane Prison, Pro Prison Project does beautiful work training, training inmates, training, that's probably the wrong word, training uh, community members of San Quentin, maybe a better way of saying it, to tend to each other, to care for each other all the way through the end of life, essentially training them hospice skills and beyond. Uh, beautiful work. And Lady Bird applies herself towards caregivers, towards uh, fellow clinicians, 
towards uh, executives too, people who are uh, program directors and otherwise who are, are not in the clinical front line, but in the administrative side of doing all this work and need help too. So Ladybird, I love you very much. It's great to see you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I also feel very humbled. Yeah, well, I don't know why you would. Because it's a, it's a beautiful crew. It's, it's amazing. It'll be nice. Well, great. Thank you. And I should say also that I get to work with both Karen and Ladybird through mental health, too. If we can grow mental health, we'll be seeing more and more of each other there, too. Um, okay, so Pamela Munster, Dr. Pamela Munster, um, she's an oncologist. Hi, Pamela. Uh, and I've had good luck working with Pamela when I was much more active at UCSF. We've shared many patients over the years. And Pamela here, too, she brings experience and has written a great book. Um, she brings experience both as an oncologist, uh, but also as a patient. And I think everybody in this group has one way or another found our way to a hospital bed too. And um, we speak with those that lens as well. So Pamela's work is uh, is mostly focused on, uh, on, on research and uh, studies, clinical studies. Um, and she takes particular pride and is very, very good at uh, quilting together care plans that are very specific to an individual and their situation, which is pretty uncommon in the in the um, in the world of uh, oncology research, the world um, um, studies, clinical studies, clinical trials. Um, so, Pamela, I can't wait to hear from you more on that and many other things that you're doing too. Um, and then the last person to bring in the mix is Aaron Boster. Der Dr. Boster is a neurologist. Uh, uh, has his own center uh, that focuses on multiple sclerosis. Uh, and so he too has done research, education, clinical work. Uh, I'm very happy to meet you, Dr. Boster. Um, it sounds like you've been up to a lot of real good in the world. And so you, you, you too are reaching out beyond just sort of local regions uh, into sort of a worldwide reach on educating, energizing, and empowering your patients. So beautiful work, great to have you. Um, okay, so guys, so let's jump in. So maybe we can start with just some basics. You know, I, I mean, on the call of however many zillions of people are on this call, I'm sure there's a wide range of experience. So let's start very sort of basic and fundamental. So teamwork, yay. Having illness is, this is a team sport. Uh, being a clinician is a team sport. It doesn't always feel that way. But maybe one thing that'd be helpful is to just even, uh, who are the, you know, the main disciplines involved in clinical work? And, you know, so I, I can name a few. Chaplains often have a, a role in this mix. Nurses, uh, physicians, um, social workers as well. And probably of that mix, uh, the social workers are probably the least well understood group. Um, and in some ways, the poise to do some of the most helpful work um, with your line of sight across sort of practical, emotional, existential issues, et cetera. So maybe, Karen, could you kind of help us understand, and Lady Bird chime in too with your experience. Can you help us understand what does a social worker do and how do we put a social worker to best use? Well, Lady Bird, go ahead if you if you have a ready answer, <laughs> because it's sort of an eclectic, eclectic work relationship with a team, and it depends on who's on the team and whether they're receptive, because not everybody is still. It's interesting that the antiquated model of interdisciplinary was top-down siloed, so we never saw each other or talked to each other, except the physicians and consult with each other. But um, there's more of what we call a transdisciplinary model that's beginning to happen and, and that's now being shut down a little bit as well, given the constraints of hospitals with COVID. So that's a whole other story. But um, I think with social work, what I do in palliative care and what most social workers can do is look at the, the domains of care and with the team and then enter in wherever the team wants us to go and more in the emotional place is ready, the spiritual, but also sometimes the physical, um, the sexuality issues, the connection with family caregivers, um, intimacy issues with self, uh, this relational kind of process. I guess I could put that in a bigger context. They do practical support as well, but it's really more 
I think about relational, even in when you're ordering a walker, it can be a clinical experience in a real positive relationship. But those are just some thoughts. Um, right on. Yeah. yeah. That's beautiful. Uh, Lady Bird, anything to add? And what about, how about on this practical side, durable medical equipment, navigating insurance? I mean, are, are those, are you guys, is the social worker the right person on the team to reach out with that kind of nitty gritty question? Or is that misplaced? Generally, it is. I mean, usually, yeah, it depends on the team, but they should absolutely be able to support with that. And if they don't have the answer, they can guide you to where you're going to find the information. So they're they're great at being the first person to help you create where you're going to go, give yeah. you the phone numbers, the addresses, make the connections for you, and really be that, that initial support so that you're not doing it by yourself. Right on. And in my experience too, social workers tend to have their eye in the ball in terms of the community resources. So even when a social worker isn't directly responsible for uh, a, a knowledge around, uh, I don't know, X, Y, or Z, oftentimes social workers tend to know the community very well and be able to point patients and families to outside resources. Is that a true, is that a fair statement? I yeah. think so, definitely. It gets used to the population working in and what people need and the lay of the land wherever you are. And I just want to say something about there are nurses who team up. My first experiences were in the burn unit way back in 1980 and then also in pediatrics where there was patient center and family center before adult medicine thought of it. <laughs> so it was just interesting to team up with nurses for different functional things that I didn't know for feeds and things like that. And at UCSF, everything is other planet medicine, so everybody has complications. And I can do the clinical piece as well, but in terms of the technical, that's where the nurse shone. And together, it was a really powerful exchange and comforting mm -hmm. for the family and the, and the child or adolescent mm -hmm. as well. And, and we never did carry that model to adults for years, actually. So mm -hmm. it's interesting. And now I think it's a little bit different because there are nurse discharge planners I'm not sure outpatient. They certainly are in our program at Kaiser, but I'm not sure with ECSF these days what that looks like. Gotcha. Well, and on that note too, I, I see a lot of social workers um, bringing in the medical team for meetings and helping to arrange conversations between medical practitioners within mm -hmm. the team and outside of the team. And so, you know, they're there for you to help communicate with yourself and your family, but also with the rest of the medical team and the medical community. And they're tracking, you know, in a, a larger field sometimes, and they can gauge when that's necessary and how to actually have the right conversation at the right time and who to approach. And they're, you know, they tend to have that knowledge. So like mm -hmm. you said, Karen, speaking with the nurses, they, they know when to pull in and out and, and really bring in the team. Beautiful, beautiful. Wow. A real utility player, it kind of defies any simple pat answer. Um, when speaking of which, guys, and anyone here chime in, maybe over to you, Aaron or Dr. Boster. Um, what about in your MS center, have you brought in other, and anyone here, other disciplines outside of the typical clinicians that we've described in a Western clinical model, integrative medicine, et cetera? Sure. So, you know, it, it takes a village, and it's a fool who thinks that he can care for a complex chronic condition um, by him or herself. Uh, I'm not. And so, you know, the, the keys to success are to create a tight village around, you know, and for me, the unit of measurement is the family. So you put the family in the center and, uh, uh, you know, it, it, this comprehensive center that I ran for many years, we had a social worker on site who was an integral part of onboarding the family to the clinic, mm -hmm. just orienting them to the new diagnosis and to the new resources. We have a registered dietitian who would be brought in to help guide people um, as they were grappling with issues related to nutrition um, and to weight gain, et cetera. We had neurophysical therapists on site as well as neuro-occupational therapists on site to help with activities of daily living and advocation as well as vocation and with the critical importance of ambulation, uh, transfers, mobility, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have uh, psychologists and neuropsychologists at the ready to help um, both grapple and transition through paradigm shifting and through the new normals of, of a chronic diagnosis, um, but also to help navigate through um, cognitive deficits and issues that may arise uh, at work or in school, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot of people that we would bring together. Uh, we must have a urologist and we must have a psychiatrist or we're not gonna be successful. And, and so we bring all of these people to bear 
and we surround the family with them um, and lift them up. Mm -hmm. Well, given all that, I mean, and on the one hand, it sounds amazing, right, to have all these people and all and the benefit of so many different disciplines and approaches to care in the mix. And at the same time, from a patient standpoint, or even a clinician standpoint, it can be dizzying to know who's doing what, and everyone's so dang busy, and communication can get so tricky. Um, you know, how do, uh, Pamela, maybe over to you, you know, thinking through, from a patient or family's point of view, how do you, how do you figure out who to talk to? Is, is it wise to try to find a single captain or a quarterback of your care within a clinic? Is that even possible? Or any recommendations for the audience there? Well, I, th I think one of the great challenges is like, you know, and at least in oncology, there's many experts. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's often, how, how do you even select the clinic and how do you find an expert? And, and what we realize is like when you have cancer, Everyone whom you, is in your contact will send you a brochure on something that's really promising. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really hard for patients, like, you know, you get from the very obscure treatment out in Mexico to like the clinic next door. And it, it's really, really hard. And I think um, finding, a, I think finding care near you is, I, I think is really important because I think it's, while it seems really attractive, it, attractive if you live in San Francisco to have care in New York, it's often just not practical. Mm -hmm. And then so so you need the team around you where you live. And then, so, and then who is the right person from your family? Uh, that's that's really personal. I think many, many really, really good marriages, the spouse may not be the, the best person to talk to when it comes to difficult conversations. And that doesn't make for a bad marriage. It just makes for some spouses have a harder time dealing with things than others. I mean, there's, I th but I think identifying the person who can can pull strings together and, and be a little bit of a captain and goes to visits and takes notes is really important. And, and BJ may not just be one person. There may be different mm -hmm. people for different things. Mm -hmm. And on that note, I've seen a lot of folks more and more, uh, even if so, sometimes we don't have some, some of us are alone, right? And some of us uh, or you know, friends or family may be too busy to attend an appointment one way or another. One trick I've, I've seen used more and more is for people to record their sessions, to, to bring their iPhone or their telephone or whatever um, and record the session so that, because we know when patients are under stress, you know, you're hearing one out of every five words or something like that. And we're talking about really he often significant, loaded, uh, heavy duty information. So so your point about bringing, a bringing an advocate with you to listen, to have a second set of ears. Um, also, another person ask questions that you may not be thinking about. But uh, the other idea here would be to record those sessions so that you can play them at home. Uh, it's it's stunning to me over the years. I remember when I first started in palliative care, you know, you hear all these stories like, well, my doctor never told me this, they never told me that, and those darn oncologists, and, and you know, there's enough truth to that, but there's often, it's often true too that those darn oncologists or those darn any other doc actually did say those things, did convey the truth, did comment on this or that issue, it just got missed in the flurry of words and these quick encounters. So, you know, what about other tips of how to, so bringing an advocate with you, yes. Recording the session, perhaps, yes. One idea, of, you know, is to go into these visits knowing that time is short, is to pre-think like what, if I'm the patient, I gotta think through what do I really need to know by the time I walk out of this visit? And very often, any of us is gonna have more questions that can get answered in one visit. So I think one piece of advice may be before you go in, write down, think through the two or three things that you know you need to get to. And if there's more room than that, great. Um, any other tips, guys, from anybody here on the panel about how to make the most of your team? Yeah, Aaron, thank you. So, you know, here we are doing a virtual lecture um, and all of the presenters and all of the listeners are scattered throughout maybe the globe. And we can take the fantasticness that is Zoom 
and apply it to a clinic uh, meeting. So if your spouse is not able to attend, or if your best friend is not able to attend, then I always encourage them to turn to FaceTime and to have them present in the room virtually. Um, mm -hmm. And so you can have that listener in a different state um, who's there still present with you and who can help participate. Um, and I found that to be a very powerful tool as well. Oh yeah, beautiful. Right on. Yeah, have you done? Second on Pamela's comment about having multiple people, that sometimes the person who you want in the medical appointment is not the same person that you want to talk about the deeper emotional elements of how you feel about what was said in the medical appointment. And trying, if you have that luxury, to, to weed that out because you want someone in there that can really listen objectively and, and hear what the, what's being said. And then you can go back and process it with somebody else if necessary. But um, trying to see if there's multiple people. Right on. We are, we're complex critters. We human. I mean, there's this social piece, there's this spiritual piece, there's an emotional piece, there's, you know, there's this sort of physical, raw, uh, bodily piece. And those different sides of us may need different folks in our mix to hear, to be with. Um, some, a lot of folks I know who can hold the practical bits of my life um, send me backwards on the emotional parts of my life. So different different folks for different pieces of the puzzle when possible. Um, and then you know, in in your family or in your in your acquaintance group, there's always the person who is sort of like a go getter, right? Mm. And, and that's maybe the person you want to organize your some of your care, organize uh, your surroundings. And then there's the people who just like spend endless time going on walks with you, listening to to you. And I think I just what I what I really want to get across is like what what I learned as a patient and as a as a physician when you have a diagnosis of cancer. And I don't know as much uh, about MS. Loneliness sets in very quickly. And it's really mm -hmm. lonely place to be sick. And and you quickly realize that maybe what you need can that your spouse, your friends cannot give you. And I think it's and that doesn't make them bad people. And that's really um it's important that you know, if you feel lonely that you don't at the same time feel abandoned. And I think that that just getting getting a team around you and not, not having all weighing on one shoulder is actually very, very difficult to be a caregiver. Right on. And we have a lot of support for the patients. We have a lot less support for the caregivers. Yeah. So true. I mean, this gets at a big reason why we started mental health and outside the healthcare system so that caregivers can come to us just as easily as patients can too. I, I'm super with you there, Pamela. Well, while we're with you, Pamela, your book, Twisted Fate, do you go into detail about, I mean, we're, I guess, is there a moment to share from the book or outside the book when you move from doctor to patient? Um, can you share any surprises in that mix that get out our big subject today one way or another? Yeah, I think for me, the, you know, I do... Uh, clinical trials uh, and new drugs for a living, right? And like we explain a lot of really complex issues and complicated things. And I remember when I was going to the plastic surgeon and talked about the mastectomy reconstruction. And now I'm an oncologist. I know every detail around this, right? And I'm thinking like, okay, that's pretty simple. Like I know what I'm doing. Well, the guy talked about taking a knife and making a cut in my chest and my mind was gone. Yeah. And I just had no idea, what, you know, I had no idea what surgery plan was, I had no idea what would come, I had no idea what my recovery was. I went home and think like, oh, wait, what did he tell me? Couldn't remember anything. And mm -hmm. like you said, BJ, it's like, if if someone had asked me, like, whether the doctor told me, I could have sworn up and down, no, never talked about this, because my mind was gone. And I think that's that's the part that I that I think I described in my book is like even well-educated well people like who know their stuff like when when the fears and anxiety set in your listening is gone. Mm -hmm. Right on. So there's no uh, so i.e. get help bring people along to listen with you and for you and 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 probably also too is don't be embarrassed to ask the same question five times because it may take you a while to hear the answer or whatever else. I mean, I'm uh, moved again and again and a little concerned again and again how, how the gymnastics to which our patients, our clients go through to protect our feelings 
mm -hmm. or that they don't want to embarrass themselves and ask a stupid question. So, you know, that I think is very common. I mean, any counsel there, you know, Karen, you've been at this for a while. Lady Bird, you've worked with such different populations. Is there, and really anyone in the group, like, what do you wish? Like, if you could whisper in the ear of your patient before they came to see you, you know, like, what do you, what do you wish your patients would ask you or feel comfortable asking you? Is that a fair question? Yeah, it's a beautiful question. I mean, I don't know if there's a question that I would want them to ask. I would wish for them that they didn't feel alone in the world, mm -hmm. that they didn't feel that they had to tackle this by themselves and somehow figure it out and know what to do or know the answers or even know who to ask for help. I mean, it's like Pamela was saying, it's very isolating and you do want to manage, you're losing all of these pieces of your um, autonomy and your reality and everything is, is shape shifting in front of you. and there's a desire to kind of hold on to that and in the holding on you lose track of where you can set back and get the support that you need um so i just yeah i wish that there was not so much um, focus on independence in this culture mm. was more of an allowance for that and that even our practitioners i mean separate from being a patient but sometimes our practitioners are so eager to be the only one to do something that they mm. also don't encourage the team or encourage the rest of the who is available and you know a good strong social worker or even a nurse is the spoke in the middle and they're not doing everything they're making sure that they're connecting that person to all of the places that they can get support so just goes back to that uh, the group and mm -hmm. it's not an isolated experience right on what about the rest of you guys Aaron uh, do you have any advice what you wish your patients or would ask you or feel comfortable any any anything like that S similar to uh, Lady Bird, I, I don't have a question I wish they would ask me, but I would wish that at least after our first interaction, they recognize that I'm on their team and that I want to be a team member um, and I want to help lift them up and help them live their very best life despite having this illness. Um, and so I want to be active in their care uh, and I want them to feel that like genuinely. Uh, that's very, very important to me, particularly as we establish a relationship. Um, a chronic condition is like a marriage um, where I, I hopscotch through the life of my patient and I feel the loss and I celebrate the success. And so really that first meeting is, is kind of getting to know a very important person. Uh, and, and so I, I guess I, I want that to be conveyed. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about self-disclosure? You know, you know, I think one of the reasons, one of the ways clinicians burn out and struggle is we're we're treated in we're treated as machines on some level and we ask crazy things of our patients too and it can be dehumanizing all the way around aaron aaron you look like you're want to say <laughs> <laughs> i love self-disclosure um i openly share that i have a uh, pretty significant depression i take antidepressants i see a counselor i i have seen psychiatrists before i have to exercise you know all these things um, I'm very open um, about when I'm incontinent of stool, like quite honestly, like I think it's very, very important that my patients know that I'm a real person and I was 38 years old working in clinic and poop my pants for real. Like, and so I, I think that if they're going to feel comfortable talking to me about intimate private things, I want to show them that I'm comfortable talking to them. Um, mm -hmm. I'm very, very open. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that every clinician needs to be that way, but but to me, that is what's comfortable. Um, yeah. You know, every single patient has my cell phone. And when I went through, you know, my divorce, my patients kept me going, um, mm. you know, because it works both ways. It's not just for them. Right. I guess what we're kind of coming to again and again is this is a relationship and relationships have both parties are involved, all parties, all of the above. This seems like a very important question. I wonder if we can keep going around the, the ring here. Karen, what about you in self-disclosure? Do's and don'ts? What have you seen work? I, I don't get in the way of the patient. They're there to see me and, and tell us a story and what they need. So it's sort of like, but if it comes in in timing and they're willing to, um, they want to know more, I'm happy to share. And at some point, maybe not in the first interactions, because when they come in, you know, nobody calls palliative care and oncology with a hangnail. So everybody is so activated 
and they don't know the definition of palliative care. It's not been represented well by the doctors who've referred. Um, mm -hmm. So they think they're going to die in a moment. So, you know, really settling that whole nervous system process and helping them co-regulate to mine um, is kind of what both myself and Dr. Damien, the, the medical director, we do that sort of in a co it's almost like a co-therapy team. I did that with you and Mike as well. Some of the best therapists I've ever worked with are you guys, <laughs> not in my profession. But, you know, just because you're willing to be creative and be human, you yeah. know, and it's okay to make a mistake. And, and sometimes it's sort of like we'll start down one path and the patient gets totally frozen. And it's like, wait a minute, I think we just said something wrong. Can you tell us? And they do. And then we apologize. And can we restart? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of coming, the phrase is coming alongside and remembering that we're not top down, even though patients put us there. And sometimes they need certain medications and need that data point, which a doctor has. So there is a sort of top down place there. But the idea of a relational process where there's no judgment and there's mm -hmm. willingness to be creative and relational um, and, and laugh. <laughs> Some yeah. Of the time. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. No. I. I. Uh, I. I almost look for moments. It's not. I. I get myself plenty of moments. I screw up a lot. I was going to say I almost look for engineer moments to screw up. I, I don't do that. I. I will screw up. It happens. I'll say the wrong thing. And to your point, Karen, I think I've been realizing, uh, in contrast to how I was trained. Uh, you know, the phrase, I don't know, or I'm so sorry, I think I just said something wrong. Those mistakes can end up being incredible moments of bonding, because that is where that invariable vertical thing gets, you really actually do come side by side, two humans trying to figure something out. So, I, I, yeah, I've seen that play out so many times. Um, Pamela, how about you on this front, especially as you've crossed over doctor to patient? I wonder, has your has your willingness to share with patients changed your openness has your practice changed from being a patient so i i uh i've always been kind of like a chatty person and uh and not very shy of asking questions and and divulging things but i think what i really learned and i think that's what i think in oncology is probably one of the sort of like really big barriers and, and worries and burnout is like um I used to completely beat myself up if I would lose a patient or a patient would not respond to therapy and I would take this sort of like as a personal failure until I kind of like learned to forgive myself and, and realize I'm as long as I try to do my best, even though it may not be the result that patient is hoping for, I just have to realize I can't really do any miracles. I mean, and I think everyone realizes if you try to go the extra mile for them that's a long way so mm -hmm. i think that's that's the difference i learned the other thing i learned is like being a patient they're great people out there and they're not my friends and the mm -hmm. same is true for for doctors right there's some really amazing personalities and you just don't mesh well mm -hmm. and i think rather than trying to make this work just move on and think, you know, don't feel bad if a patient think like, well, you know, just their type. Um, if it doesn't work, it's it's better for everyone to to find a different situation, find a different scenario. And like, as I said, like it, like in a marriage, right? There's sometimes amazing people and they get divorced. It doesn't make them bad people. It just makes them not a good marriage. And I think the same is true in a, in a doctor patients because going to back to what we said, if you can't ask the same questions five times, because you feel embarrassed or you feel like uncomfortable, what kind of relationship is this when you have end stage cancer? Mm -hmm. Well, right on. You know, I as we're talking, I realize this is a relative, at least on this subject matter, we are pre chosen to have a certain disposition and a, a workability together. But we all know that medicine isn't necessarily that's this isn't the rule in medicine. Um, Burnout is real, even if someone started as a real sweetheart, um, and you know, 30 patients a day or whatever it is. So, what what's our counsel here, guys, for the audience when they bump into, when they try, when they bring themselves to the mix, when they dare to ask questions, when they, you know, at, repeat, repeat the questions, whatever, everything we're saying. 
that doesn't necessarily, like to your point, Pamela, mean that the relationship is going to blossom. Relationships are more mysterious than that, um, mm -hmm. and in some ways beyond anyone's control, too, whether there's chemistry or not. So what's, what's our advice to the audience when, when any of us bumps up against a clinician of any sort who we just don't mesh with? Do we, what, yeah, any counsel there, guys? Um, Lady Bird, let me start with you. May I, is that all right? <laughs> well, did she, well, okay, that's one way in. Oh, there you are. No, you can't, <laughs> I hit the wrong button. <laughs> Um, that's a really challenging question. You know, I, I was thinking about it and hearing what you're talking about self-disclosure. And I was thinking from the patient's point of view that um, to really, it, it comes back to tracking to me that you're tracking with your clinician that if they if you're concerned about their well-being or their, whenever you go to the visit, you're, they're sharing so much and you sort of lose yourself, that, that ability to track your own experience when you have a, a chronic illness, it's, it's really hard to hold on to that. And so if you meet a clinician that you don't work with, you, you don't trust that usually because you're just, you sort of lost your tracking ability to really stand up for yourself and you want to get the right care and you want to do what's right. And um, finding some way, if it's a person, if it's a practice, to to stay connected to yourself throughout the entire process. And then when you come across clinicians that you don't wanna work with or family members that you don't wanna to talk to or whatever it is, that you have some sort of way to um, bring yourself back to like, you're actually the person that's important in the story. It's not about the clinician. It's not about the family members, but when you're in that mix for so long, you just, you really do lose yourself and everybody is just coming at you. Um, it's intense and um, you want to you want to make people feel happy so i would say don't worry so much about what you should do or not do just kind of take a moment and go back to yourself even if you don't make that comment in that appointment just go home cry scream whatever freak out and then say okay what was what do i really what's really right for me and if you don't know then that's a good time to realize that you need some more support so that you can remember who you are and where you're going mm -hmm. It, you bring you bring up this great point where I think the old school, so perhaps maybe it was maybe it never was this way, but it, it feels like it used to be that maybe you had you know a family doctor who took care of everything and who knew you for many 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 years and generations etc. And that in in some ways, and maybe it was that medicine was less complicated, but if it was ever the case, it seems like it used to be that you could really kind of hand yourself over to your clinician to your doctor and kind of rest assured that they're going to do take good care of you. It feels like that is just um, unnecessarily hazardous. So this idea of abdicating yourself or um, say, oh, doctor knows best. I'm assuming that none of us would counsel that, that, that really you have to stay engaged in your own care because it is so easy to lose yourself, whether because of illness or treatments or just the medical intimidation of the system. So assuming we all agree with that, um, I think that's a really, really important point. You have to bring yourself to the mix. And if yourself is a hot mess, well, that's okay. I mean, this is the whole yeah. thing here. We're, we're all, the whole subject matter here for in all one of our clinics is uh, people dealing with things that they'd rather not be dealing with. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff going off the rails by virtue of them showing up in front of us. So in, in that by extension, there's really no shame to be lost, to be confused. And so in some ways we were, I guess we're counseling everybody to own their situation, even if that's being a hot mess and confused and unsure. Um, don't leave yourself. Um, but Can back I ask to the a question, BJ, or to the panel? I mean, on that topic, there are so many clients that I work with where their physicians aren't, and nurses and the team, they're not actually listening to them. And they are being given advice to not go to palliative care, don't give up, I don't recommend that. And so there, this is a real challenge of like, I, maybe I'm not meshing or I don't trust, I don't know what to do when they're guiding me a different direction than I want to go. How do you work with your patients and clients around that? I'm curious. Erin, look like you got, yeah, please. So, uh, so, so this is a real situation that can happen frequently, right? And I remind people that if you hired a plumber to put in a sink, and the plumber started to tell you how you didn't really want the sink there, you wanted it in a different room, you, would, you wouldn't feel bad about finding a different plumber because mm -hmm. it's not about the plumber, it's about your sink in your bathroom. Well, here, 
we're talking about your body and you're a you expert you you know this is this is the only you that you get and so i think it's it's fair to be i like to say very selfish and and if if the clinician's not listening and even if that clinician is me i want the patient to say stop you're not listening to me i need you to hear me say the following and not every patient is that strong of a self advocate and so i tell them to write it down and hand it to the doctor Mm-hmm. Because that way they can, you know, that way they're not nervous in front of the clinician. But but there must be a conversation. Again, this goes back to this is an intimate relationship, right? It's like a marriage or like a, like any other intimate relationship. So if we're not working together, you need to tell me that, and I need to I need to own that, and then we we need to figure out if we can work together. And I can share with you in, in my own experience. There's been times where the answer is we cannot, and we have to separate ways. We have to find a better team member for that human. Very often, however, we are able to come to terms and, and through communicating, we're able to figure out a way to, to make it work. But I think if I, if, I, if I gave one piece of advice, it's to be profoundly selfish. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. However, that being said though, and I think Aaron has a good point, but I think, um, you know, when you show up for a visit in a complete hot mess, that usually doesn't really, end up in a really good place right so i think that's the the, and that's why i do think that patients should probably try to create a little structure around a visit but keep in mind like you know a patient may wait four or five weeks for a Mm. doctor's visit right and there's a lot of amped up expectations and everything and the doctor just had a really bad day right and Mm. there's maybe i don't know with something or the other thing so but then 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 emotions feed off in others when a patient comes in with an advocate with a recording and i find the recording super helpful actually everyone should record everything and if if you kind of like before you go on a visit structure a little bit what's important for me what are the relevant questions and even if 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 the advocates at the end side okay we had a good conversation but these are four more questions we need to ask right i think it's just having a little bit more structure Mm-hmm. I, I think the uh, it's a lot of the a lot of feelings get mixed up when it just the, the question is not heard or not not asked. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the question is there, like you're actually answering a question rather than feeding it to an emotion is usually easier. Mm-hmm. Right on. So having some like you know a list of a handful of questions you'd really like to get to, mm-hmm. um, and I think even that sort of this meta level too, like I love when a patient or a client says to me, just so you know, I had a terrible morning, I'm in a horrible mood, I don't know what the heck to, you know, in a way they may be in a made of chaos, but their self-awareness, they're holding that too. They are letting me know, they're signaling to me. That may be asking too much. Sometimes we just can't be aware of everything at the same time. But I just I guess it is to welcome. If we if a client or a patient's walking to our office and they and they know that they're not in a good space, no need no no charm or nothing gained by pretending otherwise. Um mm-hmm. you know what I say. No. But how about we're gonna say something further, Pamela? I'm sorry. Yeah, I also think there's there's a, a couple do and don'ts for oh. I think patients should know. And like I have to say, like, you know, being older and wiser and being a program leader, there's a lot more hesitations. People have to to ask me things. But I see often my younger calling getting grilled on their knowledge in the field or whether they are like really qualified. And uh and you would never go into a date and ask the other person whether he, he's qualified to actually even meet with you, right? That would not make for a good date. So I think it doesn't make for a good doctor visits either. And I, I see a lot of uh, my young colleagues just completely grilled in, in this. And then, and then they get frustrated and the patient get frustrated. And um, so mm-hmm. I think as, as a patient, consider that the doctor is human may have a bad day, may be really busy and and sort of like an, and you know, just don't ask the first question, what is your qualification? Mm-hmm. And I think yeah. that's, that's often, and please don't come with a stack of internet printouts and all the things you read that you should have mm-hmm. before you actually listen what the doctor have to say. I think these are the uh, relationships that I've seen invariably go wrong. Mm-hmm. 
in a way, you're pointing us back to, the, again, this is a relationship and you should handle it with all the respect that goes into any relationship, mm -hmm. uh, not yeah. grilling each other, testing each other. I mean, you, in some ways, we need to signal trust to each other. In some ways, it's there to gain, but in some ways, it's there to be lost, too. Um, Karen, were you going to say something on that note? Well, yeah. I so agree with everybody, but the context of academic medicine at UCSF, it just was not safe to mm -hmm. be like human. <laughs> and people learn that early in their training. So how to let that go when the teams weren't even feeling safe enough, it wasn't fair to the physicians or anybody else. And so, whoa, you navigate it out there on your own, not to mention, as you know, everything is distracting itself. I, I mean, the article, 4,000 clicks a day, I, you probably all know that this was like eight years ago when it was written as an op-ed in JAMA. Yeah, that's how much they counted. It's like, oh my God, where's the patient care? You know, so the idea of really as a team kind of turning to each other, I now it, it just say, what's it like for you? Did it land? You know, I think with COVID right now, I work with mid-career professionals, oncologists at this point and, and palliative care. And they were not very safe at all or didn't feel that way. We're very top down kind of information, and yet none of them were that way as a person. So the idea of let's just talk about this for a minute. What, what do you need? And, and the curbside started happening. Can you come in and, and be with me with this patient? And just here's what we, I need to say, something really hard. A la hmm. Bible talk, you know, that sort of evolved into that. Some of them really love that training. But the idea of you don't have to cycle babble, you just have to make it safe. And if you screw up, then it's okay to say, I think I need to rethink this. What do you think? You know, the idea of keeping on the ground in your body. And I think in that way, now with COVID, everybody's exhausted 20 months into this now and so a lot of doctors who are incredibly good clinicians where i work in other consultation are missing things that are basic and then when we get them in palliative care it's like oh they can deal with all this because i can't talk to them and so we're doing primary care <laughs> palliative care and it's just my doc and me and it's happening a lot more because of the exhaustion of clinicians so how to yeah acknowledge that help people get into their body and land in the moment so they can learn how to track and not get into a free state because the patient might be so i always think about it in a neuroscience yeah what's the adaptive capacity of you today and you might run across a little person who has none and then they get traumatized and so you might end up having to chat tell them different things so the assessment of that is a little different than every other patient to slow it down to make sure they can um, at least land a little bit between you and them and maybe if they have somebody with them, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think learning those nuances in a somatic sense and then it's it's a trauma-based cultural process and thank God neuroscience and somatic work and medicine are all kind of meeting and psychology is coming up in the rear. <laughs> so it can help language and normalize what we are all in because i think the suffering is enormous for patients and families but also for us as clinicians so it's hard to yeah. titrate that often and yeah, yeah. And, yeah. sorry to interrupt you karen no i'm sorry i you know i just want to make this point i think when it's come up a few times is there is a lot to criticize in our medical system i mean just I, I think I can say that as safely that we would all agree. Um, it is it is an amazing system that does amazing things. I I my life has been saved by it, um, and it's deeply problematic and causes pain uh, uh, sometimes uh, more often than it soothes it. So I guess one point here is one we're saying. I just want to make it explicit is. I think we all should be very uh, critical of our healthcare system. It is a it is an invented thing, so therefore it can be changed, and we need feedback. And I think it's a very important distinction um, to, to say to be critical of the system and its issues. That's very different from being critical of the people working in the system. And so I think we'll all do better, whether anyone on this call, whether you're a provider or a caregiver, is to remember that and start from that place uh, and enter into any conflict with that assumption and go from there. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to say that. But um, guys, is it 
So there was a question that came up here. Um, Pamela, back to you for a second about this in terms of, you know, you want to signal trust and don't grill that poor junior doctor just to see what they do, you know, just to kind of gotcha kind of junk. But one thing that does come up is like if it's a surgery or a procedure, you know, it does seem pretty reasonable that you're going to want, if I'm having an operation, I'm going to want to have someone who's done it a few times, you know. Um, so, you know, is it reasonable, guys, uh, to ask a doctor how often they've done a procedure, how often they've seen this or that? Is that a fair question or how how to put it so that, I mean, it's one thing to test a doctor to try to, to you're looking to get to get them, but how do you ask these kinds of questions that actually may have a meaningful answer? Aaron or and or Pamela, I would love to hear from you both. I I personally do not mind when patients, um, you know, I, I used to be asked frequently, like, are you old enough to be the doctor? And I would say, how old would you like the doctor to be? Um, mm -hmm. Or they would say, have you ever done this? And I would say, no, but I just watched a YouTube video on it um, <laughs> and make light of it. And and um, I, I personally don't think it's wrong. You know, so for example, a neurologist will do a lumbar puncture, which is kind of a scary thing to have done to you if you're not familiar with it. Um, and so I, I told them I used to count how many I did because I was asked and when I reached 100, I stopped counting, and that was like 15 years ago. You know, so I have a talk track prepared to be able to respond to that because I think that is a fair question. Um, you know, you expect the pilot of the airplane you're flying to have flown a lot of times. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, right. So I wanna wanna get this. Uh, I mean, as I said, Aaron, and I, we're both a little older, so I think that helps. I think there's ways to ask this question. Something like if you did a lumbar puncture on me and the doctor is kind of young, you could ask, well, how likely is this going to be easy to do on me? Right? It's uh -huh. like rather than saying, have you done this before? Is this going to be easy on me? Am I going to be a difficult case? Have you seen a case like, is my case difficult? Right? Then the doctor says, no, your case is not difficult because I've done, it's sort of like it's not this, uh, BJ, do you know what you're doing? It's just kind yeah. of like, you know, it's this, as I said, it's, 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 it's a relation. Yeah. Smart. Dance around a little bit, and like, then you get your answers, like. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah, so how, like, again, back to relational dynamics, I mean, how, it's not whether or not to say some of these things, it's sort of how you say it. And if you're bringing respect and your intention is to get an answer to a question that means something to you or something to do with your safety, that's very important. If your intention is to power trip the doctor and undermine them, well, that that's going to show and that's probably not a great idea. So how we say these things, how we surface our issues matters in all directions. Um, so. Um, anyone else, anything else to say on that before I move off to a different subject? We're coming up on time for uh, questions, but before we do that, guys, on on the various things we've talked about so far, any last little thoughts um, before we cut to questions? Well, I just want to comment on the what you just said about power tripping versus, you know, doing this dance around, and I, I guess I want to go back to when you're in that, that tornado of chronic illness, the power tripping comes because you're afraid and you know we all know that but for you as for a patient if i'm speaking to a, a people out there who are in that seat right now to remind yourself where those questions are coming from like why do i want to know that and get really clear about why you want to know that because then it might come across differently even if you have an edge to you because some people just have an edge mm -hmm. and you know they just want to have safe care and so you can still be edgy and want safe care but this it goes back to what karen also said around tracking and right. if you know that you're not and you can't do it very well, to just have someone else, if you can, um, be that little buffer when you go into the room. Right. Oh, yeah. And, but I think that's that's why I think having your advocate or having your friends there, so you can ask this question, doctor, are you comfortable doing this for me? Right. And that's the question. That's really what you want to know because. I have seen people having done hundreds of procedures and they still do them poorly. So that is not necessarily. So I, I think it's really in the end, what you want to know, am I going to be okay? The question is, am I going to be okay if you do this to me or if you recommend this? And I think that's the question we want to get to because that, that allows the doctor also to say like, it's going to be difficult, 
right? Mm -hmm. And like, and that that opens that relationship, but, but that puts the patient in a vulnerable spot. And that's why sometimes if the advocate says like, "Is my wife going to be okay if she goes through this?" It takes the pressure off a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right on, beautiful. Um, guys, well, you know, maybe let's cut to questions here unless anyone else wants to say anything further right now. But I will say, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> anyway, maybe I'll come back to it. Hey, Alexa. Absolutely. You can absolutely come back to that. Um, I've been sitting here as a patient, just soaking this all in. I love it. Dr. Boster, I have no reservations if you ever need to perform a um, spinal tap or anything like that on me. I feel very confident now. And uh, I got to say, guys, we have a great audience because I've actually come on early because we've gotten so many good questions and I know you're ready. You're ready to, to answer them. So we were emailed this question and I've experienced this too as a patient. So I want to know the answer myself. Um, how do you handle Dr. Ego? So mm -hmm. everyone in this room is very collaborative, but there are some providers who are not as collaborative. What's your advice for navigating this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyone want to jump in on that one? <laughs> Um, Karen, I know you've seen a lot of Dr. Egos in your, in your yes, career. <laughs> and usually they hate social work. I mean, let me just say that's uh, that sometimes just is in front of the patient. Even <laughs> so, I ground myself. You know, when I you, I can read people's micro expressions pretty well, even on Zoom these days, and building up that kind of work, but. Um, okay, this is not going to be as easy as I thought. And so where can I do the bridging of not trying to change the person or thump on them or anything like that? They may thump on me or want to, but you know, the idea of moving around that defensiveness of that person is interesting to me. So it, I'm not always good at it 100% of the time, especially if I have a more deeply involved situation with a patient and we're trying to make a point that that happened a lot at UCSF and and occasionally I'd get caught in these kind of conundrums and we'd even have to call an ethics committee. So I was like, oh God, <laughs> I'm unemployment probably after this, you know, but but I think just moving through and still trying to stay in the moment, grounding in the feet is really helpful or in the breath or whatever body part I can in the moment that I can feel. And sometimes even washing my hands and trying to feel the water because nobody bothers you in the hospital doing that. So that's another reason they think you're doing nosocomial infection, good hygiene. <laughs> so two minutes, 20 seconds, but the rest of it is like, okay, I can feel the sensation again, the warmth of the water. Uh, that's a somatic response, settling the nervous system so that I'm out of the woods of the cortisol flow. <laughs> so stepping aside from that, I can then decide what's gonna serve in the moment, not what I thought was serve, but that's the other question I asked after grounding the attunement it's like what will serve in the moment right now and it may not be very much but then i do a sort of ethical ending or tuck it in and mm. i'm not touching that person's ego they need it for whatever defense or reason and a lot of people are trained that way in many of the academic centers and need it for a lot of different reasons you know so it's it's tough though what about other people <laughs> well it reminds me of what I was, what I forgot to say a second ago, which is I think a lot of people don't know. First of all, you can change doctors. It may that may be asking you may live in a place where there are not options, but oftentimes there are options. Uh, and, and Aaron and others in this group have have, ref, have pointed to this. You don't you don't have to just put up with it. I mean, you can change doctors. Um, you know, and just another sort of a bioethics piece too is to know that I, I, I'm stunned how uh, how often it's useful to remind folks this. As a patient, you can always, always, always say no to a treatment. You do not have to do something because your doctor tells you to. You can't demand that a doctor prescribe you something. That is his or her call. But you can always say no. Um, so that is a really important piece of this mix, including saying no to you as a doctor, like I'm, you know, finding somebody else. So anyway, I want to throw that in there. Yeah. Anybody else uh, need some counsel? Uh, 
Yeah, I, I think it's going back to uh, if if you really invoke someone's ego or someone has an, an overly sized ego and can't get around it, that's probably not a good doctor for you, right? It's like a, whatever, if that person gets triggered by you or like a, it's, it's not, a, and there's really rare occasions where you cannot change doctors, I would think. Uh, and even the so-called experts, um, there, there's, there's many experts. Um, and then if that doesn't really happen, I would think it's like, again, like that, that questions that you have those seven questions on your list, um, you know, trying to, as a patient, get you back on like, I'm not annoyed about the doctor. I just really want to have my questions answered. So it's, it's mm -hmm. just, you know, why am I here? What are my questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And many times I tell the patient, like, you know, you don't need to marry a doctor either, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's right. I mean, questioning like what your doctor is there for. Sometimes if you just need a really good technician and that's all you really need and that's what they're good at and their attitude is just whatever. And if you can tolerate that, okay. Um, mm -hmm. But you don't have to just put up with it just to put up with it. Um, you know, sometimes it's like in life in general, ego, when you run to ego can be you know, uh, strategic to stroke that ego a little bit. And you can say, oh, doc, you know, gosh, you're the best, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I, I, I'm i the expert of me. I don't know all the stuff you know, but I sure do know me, and blah, blah, blah. And that's pretty dang hard to argue with a statement like that. So mm -hmm. if you can find a wherewithal to disarm and move, you know, that may be asking too much in a stressful visit, but that can be very, very effective. So Dr. Miller, on that note, we actually had a follow-up question regarding what you just said about patients sometimes don't know you have the right to change doctors and you can change your team, which we've talked about kind of tonight, you know, assembling some of the best team for you. But how do you fire a doctor? I know it's a very harsh term, but how how can you change your doctor? What's the protocol? Is there is there something you can help patients of how you can navigate this? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I'd love to hear from uh, Aaron and Pamela on this um, too, because I think sometimes it's practice specific. I've counseled some of my clients to go back to their doctor where it's really not working and to say, you know, and to say, you know, to just be honest and say, I, I, I respect what you're doing. I, I it's, this fit just doesn't work for me. X, Y, and Z. You don't owe an explanation. And I'd really like to. Is it would it be okay if I spoke with someone else in your practice? I've never, uh, I've, I've only heard of, I've heard one time that someone did that and the person said, no, our practice is, this is the way it is. You get who you get. And I'm so sorry. Um, but most of the time, most of the time, especially if you handle it, like, again, a human relationship, you say, look, it's not working for me X, Y, and Z. Would it be, can you help me set, find this other doctor? Can you refer me to this other doctor? Most of the time that doctor is going to have to swallow hard, but they are duty bound, bioethically bound. Um, to help you find if they if they can provide the care that you need, ethics would hold that they need to help you find a doctor who would. Now that's what it says on paper. Whether that actually happens is another question. But I've seen that work pretty darn well in my experience. Now, Pamela, Aaron, how about you being the other doctors in this crew? Go ahead, Aaron. Okay. Um, I just lost my thought. Thank you, Dr. Miller. <laughs> Let me see if I can collect it back. Um, I can think it, of about firing a doctor uh, or or maybe stepping away from a doctor. And I, I guess, at least in my own practice, I like to remind patients that they can always have a second opinion. I mean, when I meet them, like, hello, welcome to my practice. I It's part of our initial conversation that if there's ever a question, that they tell me the city, I'll tell them the expert in that city and we can get a second opinion. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, I'm not, I don't think that's a topic to shy away from. Again, it's a relationship. Um, and transparently, there's been times that I've had to fire a patient. I don't like that terminology, but 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 I I think that it's, it's part of a dynamic and a discussion. And Dr. Miller, you've said that so many times because I think it's maybe the critical point of what we're talking about today. Also, just operationally, it's very important that a patient has a copy of all of their MRIs and a copy of all their records. And so I think as a best practice, a patient should always ask for a copy of all of their MRI discs and all of their clinic notes. 
Um, and that way, when they change doctors, because invariably things may change, they don't have to go through medical records. They have a hard copy of all of their stuff. So I, I just think that's a, a good practice for a patient. So we have a little bit of a different system. So at the uh, in some of the practices, at least at the breast program at UCSF, um, typically we don't switch among providers. So if you if you want to fire your doctor, you typically don't get to see another person in the practice because we all cover for each other's. It's it's a lot more challenging. So I I would say like if you don't like your doctor at all, like the natural thing would be to just find someone else somewhere else. Because if you go, if if someone fires my best friend and then comes to me, that already puts a different spin on that relationship, right? Because I already know that person did not like my friend and colleague. So um, I respect all my friends and colleagues. And I'm thinking like, if they can't get along with that person, then I'm a lot worse And how are they gonna get along with me? So I'm not not that excited to see a patient who fired my friend, right? So so that's, that makes already like a, a relationship worse than is and then from a patient's perspective uh, the act of firing is actually that involves a lot of emotion and i would think that's not a good way of spending emotion when you are sick so, so just let it go away quietly and when aaron i don't know how you are but if patients just don't come back to me i don't go and find out what happened i just accept that person moved on it's like uh and so, so I don't. Sometimes I make call just to make sure they're safe, but right. yeah, but you know, it's, it's they're allowed to move on, and and we have to recognize that that we were a member of their team, and now they're going to move on, and maybe they need a different team, and that's okay. And, and you know, I remember at, at one person firing me because she thought I was just too too blunt, and ultimately. You know, I'm over 50. I'm Swiss. I have a certain personality. None of this is going to change, right? It's like there's just there's no school I can go to to be less blunt, and there's no couples therapy I can go to with this patient to make this work. Ultimately, say like, I'm sorry. I, you know, this is me, right? It's like you mm -hmm. can't change my personality. It's not that I'm trying to do anything deliberately bad, but mm -hmm. I'm blunt and I'm direct. Mm -hmm. I know. Well, and, so maybe and, the bottom line is, sorry. And, and just to take this a little further, like if if the patient doesn't like you, it's a good chance that that that's not good for you either, right? So let patient go away, let patient fire you. Don't hold on to patients who don't get along because it's this is not the time in your life to make a relationship work. Yeah. That's my yeah, and write it write it in a letter if you can. Write it out first, you know, like why is it that you're leaving and what you want different, what's not working, and read it to yourself, read it to somebody you trust, see how it lands and see if you change your thoughts or your mind about what you're even wanting to be different. And then maybe have it sent in or go through the social worker or go through the nurse that's in the clinic that you've made a relationship with and say, I'm gonna be bringing this in, you know, what, do you, what are your thoughts? And get some support. Again, don't think that you have to sort of tackle this ego on your own. It's very overwhelming and daunting, so mm -hmm. it helps. Yeah. Should we move on to the next question? Or are there sure. more? Sure. So I have a really good question that I think all of you could touch on. It'd be really interesting. So when somebody feels like their medical team is great, I've got a Dr. Boster, I've got a Dr. Munster, I've got a Dr. Miller, and I'm doing great medically, but I'm not doing so well emotionally, and I need some help with that. Number one, I would love to hear all of, all of you say, that is great, it is great to need help for that, to ask for help. And second, how do you go about bringing some on your team someone on your team to help with that how do i find a social worker how do i find a therapist and who on my team can i talk to about that mm -hmm. <laughs> well one thing i mean just to say is i mean this is a reminder this is a team sport and while doctors and we do karen used the word earlier about transdisciplinary care and a good team not only has their discipline down, but they also are working across aisles and um, 
can fluently move through these roles and bring in other people on the team. So if your point of contact is the doctor, um, you know, honestly, most of the time it's going to be a relief to the doctor who usually doesn't have much time uh, to help, you know, to to find someone. So if you, you just might ask your doctor or say, like, I've got a bunch of like, stuff I just really like to just sit and talk with someone about. I'm really worried about X, Y, and Z. Is there a nurse or a social worker on the team who I could meet with? You know, that that's generally a great idea and very often possible, especially in big, big medical centers. You'd like to think that the doctor is, has their eye on it and knows just when to refer you to that nurse or the social worker or therapist or whatever, but don't assume as much. I mean, there's just too much going on. So but another part of self-advocacy would simply to be like, hey doc, anyone on your team I could just sit and talk to in an open-ended way? I'm worried, I got some worries and I really need to, I need an ear. You know, th that that's a, an idea. Um, what else guys? So the other thing is like, a, an you know, we all of you have with patients or have been patients at one another. What you realize is like people get really tongue tied around you, and all of a sudden, people walk around you like you have some kind of like leprosy, and just no one talks anymore. I think it's and and sometimes you have to reach out and say like, "Hey, I'm doing well." Right? People walk by and they kind of like you see their eyes go somewhere else. You can say, "Hey, I'm doing good." Mm -hmm. You know, you can ask me how I feel like them. Just there's a lot more have to come from you as a patient uh, because people in the US all think you can't ask you how you feel when you have cancer. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that uh, as a patient, once you learn this, it becomes a little bit easier. And then and then if if someone asks you a bunch of questions, it's OK to say, like, I'm OK, but today I'd like not to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think it's, it's really the communication from a patient. I think and you just re need to reach out. It'd be so surprising how, how the chattiest people all of a sudden don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. I mean, another idea, right? Oh, another idea would be simply because because we know clinicians don't recommend palliative care soon enough, and it's people confuse palliative care with end of life care, and there's all this misunderstanding about it. Um, and, and you might run into some ego-driven docs who think that they understand palliative care and they don't want, need that other, blah, blah, blah. But if you, the patient, you, you know, another answer to this good question would simply be, hey, doc, um, is there a palliative care program involved? You will probably know better than the doctor what palliative care does, which is, has nothing to do with death. I mean, it's sort of a, it's a team-based approach to suffering and quality of life, basically helping you feel as well as possible no matter what you're going through. So if you, the patient, ask for a palliative care referral, you're much less like you're much more likely to get in touch with them in good time versus if you're waiting for the doctor to refer. Yeah, and I even go back to something, Dr. Boster, you mentioned about just technology and Zoom in terms of bringing you know your family or advocate into the room with you. But we have this global world right now, and I mean I know I have friends and you know that can't get palliative care because there isn't somebody available for them where they live. But guess what? There are a lot of people on the planet and being willing to look outside of your smaller world to see what's available and ask. And it goes back to knowing your own comfort because a lot of times we're not comfortable asking for help. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's hard to actually get those words out that you need support and care and doing it online can be an, an, an easier first step with people that aren't in your community. You're not meeting the doctor who knows your husband who's a doctor who you know all those things so don't forget that we have a really extended um, network of resources available to us that can be confidential um, and then you can kind of bring it back in to like this is going to work that's not going to work and, and again have someone navigate that with you because when you're really sick it's just completely overwhelming and so i just you know, can't say it enough to, that don't imagine that you must do it by yourself you can even get a stranger to help you because you know a social worker can help you get a stranger or you know get on the next door and say I'm at home I need help navigating finding some palliative care and mm -hmm. it would be kind of shocking that nobody would respond but, and this is where I, I should I'd be kind of silly to not mention mental health I mean this is where this is very much why we set mental health up which is just basically online palliative care counseling and coaching that you don't need a referral for exactly to your point Lady Bird um, a lot of people don't have palliative care where they live or in their health system. But so going online um, can be a great way to go. 
um, and so metalhealth.com. So, so Dr. Miller, I have a follow-up question on what you just said. Um, so number one, I think that's why we do it. We do it here at ANCAN is because virtually it removes barriers. And that's what we're all about, obviously. We don't want transportation or cost or distance or anything to be a barrier. And that's what's great about mental health. Mm -hmm. So one of the things is if somebody went to mental health, do you only do cancer for palliative care or do you do other conditions? Oh, anything under the sun. Uh, we, you don't. You know, so I said earlier, we love uh, when caregivers often reach out to us, people who on themselves are not directly sick per se, um, often reach out to us. Um, so no, cancer, you know, suffering of any kind, really, um, transitional moments in a life. It's interesting when, since we've moved this sort of work outside of the healthcare system, um, the people who find us, uh, oftentimes, you know, they're coming from they may be in remission, you know, they may have had sick, been cancer or heart disease that got or something got fixed years ago, but they're still trying to, they still don't feel quite right. They still haven't reintegrated that experience. So some of our clients aren't even sick. Um, and a, not, not a, and a few of them have reached out to us because they're going through a divorce or a career change. So you know, we're we're trying to depathologize the whole kid and caboodle. So no, you you don't not only do you not have to have cancer, you don't even have to be sick. <laughs> so yeah, all comers, welcome. Who couldn't use more support, Dr. Miller? That's kind of and the that, point. yeah. Mm -hmm. That leads me kind of to my next question. Um COVID is obviously is still a ever-changing situation. And Karen touched on this a little bit. We've been in this arena around 20 months. And when you put it like that, wow, that that's that can be very overwhelming for patients and providers. Because I know it's changed the way that everybody has had to do things. So we had a question of how do you do things differently with COVID? And how can you address needs of patients in spite of COVID? Well, go for it. I'll I'll uh, kick it off. You know, so um, my patients, similar to Dr. Munster's patients, are typically immunosuppressed at my hand. So we now have someone who um, is being asked to shield at home and is truly in a very, very precarious position if infected. Um, and to make matter, you know, so 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 this is very, very real uh, in the MS space as it is in the cancer space. And um, you know, I I think that telemedicine is a godsend. If there is a silver lining to a global viral pandemic, it's that uh, the world started to listen to people with chronic illnesses and they started to offer virtual, you know, care. And so, you know, I, I actually think um, there's been situations where we've done a better job. Uh, you know, in, in the past year, to Dr. Miller's point, there's a paucity of psychiatry uh, in, in the world. And, and I've been a junior psychiatrist and seen patients from Florida weekly on on telemedicine um why because it was the right thing to do and it worked and so so i i think there are ways to to leverage this now what about a comprehensive service you have to be creative so we have home health agencies that will go into your home wearing full ppe um and so we've been doing pt and ot and home health aids throughout the entire pandemic through a special home health service we offer counseling through psychiatrists and through therapists through telemedicine and we, we connect a lot of people to telemedicine therapists. So I think that there is a lot of opportunities to leverage technology to continue to provide excellent care while keeping people safe. I mean, right now there's a Brady Bunch on this screen in front of me with five humans from different places and we're all talking and that's pretty slick. <laughs> True. And I think sometimes it's like, um, as a physician, right, the, or as a, as a team, you know, there's there's times in the life of a patient where you're just angry, and and sometimes, I you know, if I have a patient coming in and say like, I'm just really angry today, I just need you to listen, I'll sit there, put my feet up, and just listen and let this person vent. If I know the person is angry, but he's not angry at me, then you know, it's perfectly fine with me. But and I think that's that's not easy. And again, some people are just really afraid of dying, right? And some people are really 
things and that that's the only thing they want to discuss in that visit it's perfectly fine and like um and it's it's okay to ask uh, your physician to just to schedule a visit for that and that's you don't need to have a physical exam for that you could probably do this as a as a virtual visit right yes i i remember when i was pregnant with my last child and i was like i think i was 36 weeks pregnant and that poor gynecologist i just said like i'm paying you to just let me vent because right now i'm really just in enough is enough and you know it took exactly five minutes and then i was over it and life was good again and i never forget that i just sat there probably like freud combed his hair or something but it's, it's okay <laughs> But how important you got witnessed. And I think that's the idea of that word is sort of bearing witness to somebody else, staying in the charnel ground, so to speak, not running away. But yeah, that's not what you fix. You just notice and connect. And it is, it's really hard with COVID because all of us as providers also live in trauma. So when you finish with a patient who's in trauma because they've just been diagnosed and it's not just a pain in the kidney, but stage four, neuroendocrine prostate cancer that's not going to have treatment and that's what they find out in a month you know it's like omg but then when they leave maybe getting them settled a bit the next patient comes in same thing and we step outside to our families and there is trauma we're in a social psychology calls it a cascade of trauma even within the medical institutions if you're in the ed it's really different than if you're in outpatient clinic but we're all in trauma the limbic system is like totally operating in a fear state. So how do you ground again between patients? And I think what you did was go to somebody on your team maybe or somebody you knew and they that's what they did. They're sort of like, oh my God, we all need those people on the team, I think, to help us navigate and debrief what sticks because it will <laughs> at this point. Um, and, and just noticing that's not perfect at all, but we aren't. And I think the taboo about emotions in this culture is bizarre. It's so, so needed. But I know in a lot of teaching that I've done in medical schools, there's a whole generation of folks, and I did this with neurologists who are again or mid-career, and we're teaching about emotions and how to say hard stuff and partner somebody. And, and one of them said, oh, there's an app about this. So I was thinking, Paul Ekman's app, yeah, it's really good. But and they were really serious. They had no idea what an emotion was. And they might have been in an Asperger place, uh, like Sathamic, I don't know. But it, it was teaching that. So their homework assignment was to go watch Inside Out, because <laughs> that's at least starting to talk about how we're connected again. But it, it is really an interesting um, process of reconnecting body, head, and soul, I think, in, in that way. But, yeah, and, and it happens to all of us. So it's a shared common human experience. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful, Karen. And that's all the time that we've had for questions. And I, I wish we had all night long. Uh, thank you guys all so much for, for answering those so honestly and truthfully and reminding us all that this is a relationship and the respects go on both sides. And I think if we work together, we can do a really good job. Um, so thank you, everybody. I am going to call on AMCAM's board member, Dr. Herbert Geller, to close this out. Thank you all. I think this was an outstanding discussion, an outstanding educational experience for all of us. And, and I just thought I would just sort of give what I thought were the takeaway messages that we learned here. And one is that uh, to paraphrase one of uh, somebody we know well, it really takes a village to manage all of our medical conditions. Mm -hmm. And the village not only contains physicians, it contains social workers, contains psychological support, it contains dietary support, which we didn't mention. And the other thing we didn't mention either is I don't, and, and if we can deal this another time is, you know, what are the financial implications of disease and how does that weigh on how we treat patients? Mm -hmm. uh, the other takeaway message that I think you've echoed and really is the and can watchword is that you are your own best advocate. We like to tell our members that 
Nobody's going to speak up for you better than you will speak up. You need to be an advocate for yourself with your physicians, with your team. Not only that, and that leads to, to, the, to the last point that I want to make, and, and that's the subject of communication. That essentially the communication between you and your team needs to be two-way. That you need to be able to communicate to your medical team and your support team your needs so that they can respond to you. And at the same time, you, and I'm talking to our physicians and clinicians here, need to communicate to the patient what you know your expectations of their behavior and how you can best treat them in a way that benefits everybody. So there are a lot of other issues that I think we touched on. Uh, I think, but I think for me the key issue that I that I'd like to focus on is number one is that it, it, it it's a village that that manages all of us, and number two that communication between the members of the village and that includes patient support team, their relatives, their caregivers have to be included as well in this village, ensures that I think everybody has the highest success and quality of life going forward. And thank you all for your uh, participation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>